Well, hey, thanks for clearing that up on that other matter. I do appreciate it. Oh, hey, uh, just one more question, Gary. What's with these, uh, you know, these, these, I guess you'd say mainline libertarians where they're justifying or try to, you know, say that, oh, when the illegals scamp across the border, that's all, you know, perfectly fine. I mean, I don't know. It's almost as if they have no uh, understanding of trespass. Well, I don't think it's them that have no understanding of trespass or they wouldn't go to great extent to uh, to achieve coming across the border. I mean, this can cost them thousands of dollars. They hold up. I saw a video once that was done pretty professionally uh, following these people at a camp where they gathered together, and they know they're breaking the law. They're looking around all the time and all that. And one time they started to go, and there was – uh, border patrol trucks. They all came back and waited for another opportunity to go over. So no, they, they they have no qualms. They know what they're doing is wrong. The problem is the people on the other side of the border from these people that are trying to come up here that say they're doing no wrong. It doesn't, you know. I'm sure that word gets back to Mexico, but these people don't uh, say, okay, well, I don't have to worry. I don't have to hide if I see a border patrol, patrol cut truck because all those people in America say it's okay uh, for me to come up there and that I'm not breaking the law. I'm just undocumented if I come up there. So they don't buy the line that the, the people on the other side of the border say, hey, we should have open borders. They should be able to come up here. Well, they can. There's a procedure for it. But So the people in Mexico probably have a better understanding. What's the word you use? Trespass. That's a good word. They have a better understanding of trespass than many Americans do. Uh, yeah, no kidding. And that's and that's the other thing too with the uh you know, the mainline libertarians will mention and they will be very staunch about property rights, but then when it comes to the border, especially the southern border, because I don't see anybody getting upset about the northern border anytime soon, but especially the southern border, they act kind of like the liberal status do, with oh, you're a racist and you know, all these other, you know, just just very droll kind of accusations. That have nothing to do with uh, property rights. I'm, I'm just kind of appalled personally. Put it in a different perspective. Let's say that 20 people together get together and buy a piece of land, and uh, let's make it 21. A little easier. We don't have to deal with dealing with the tie. And so the 21 people get together and they buy a piece of land just outside of a town, and they find out people are going and camping on the land. So they sit down and have a meeting and say, well, should we just people let people camp there? Uh, should we charge them a nominal fee? Should we try and make money off of this? Or should we not allow people on the property? Those are the choices we have. What are we going to do? Well, the majority says we're going to charge people, and they have to fill out this form and all this if they're going to come over uh, camp on that land. Okay, well, that's the decision. It's a collective decision by the owners of that piece of land. Now, we've got a piece of land that stretches from Mexico to Canada, ocean to ocean, and has a couple outlying pieces on it. And we've got a board through representatives who administer that. And that board has, uh, by virtue of the authority of the majority, enacted laws regarding people camping on this land, coming into this land, using this land for any purpose. And they require certain steps to be taken. Uh, certain in, in lieu of fees, they, uh, you know, certain applications to be made. Uh, they even have provisions what happens when these people violate these conditions that are set upon it. Now, let's go back to the little piece of land. Let's just say they decide that they're going to have an application, a nominal fee and all that. And one of the owners says, well, I don't like that, so I'm going to let these people under my authority come on this land and camp out. Well, the other people come to him and say, hey, that's not what we agreed on. Well, I agreed on it. Well, look, we're going to buy you out and kick you out uh, because we made a decision, and we're all bound by that decision because the whole concept of democracy and the Republican – well, democracy in this case because there's not Republican form in it uh, – is that the majority rules. And when we enact something, unless it's unenacted – in accordance with our bylaws or constitution, then it stands, and, that, and that's the rule. And you're violating the rules, so you're out. Here's the money for your share. We'll buy it. Now 20 of us own this land. Um, that's the, the small of it, and the large of it is the United States, that we have enacted uh, 
procedures for it, and we have defined certain things. We put fences up. Why are we building these millions of dollars worth of fences if there's supposed to be an open road? It's kind of contradictory, but the expenditure of the millions of dollars for these border fences and the millions of dollars for border patrol is indicative that the majority don't want this to happen. So maybe we ought to take that minority that thinks they ought to come over here and put them back down there because they are trespassing on this country in violation of the rules that have been established by the majority. And that established majority, unless and until it's changed, is valid. Now, this leaves out getting into the philosophical aspects of the sovereignty of a nation. Uh, however, most countries don't allow foreign ownership of land. Uh, many of them allow foreign ownership up to 49% of the ownership, but never a majority. Uh, a lot of the South American countries, but some countries, there are no foreign owners of land at all. But we seem to be giving it away. We don't have a law against that ownership. We do have procedures. Um, but our, our biggest problem is these people that think they should be able to walk freely across the border and come up here and, and to hell with what the laws are, uh, seem to think that they have individually assumed an authority over the collective. And there's just something wrong with this picture. Those people should probably be put back across the border and not allowed back across until they agree to abide by the rules. If that party that was kicked out of the ownership wanted to come back and buy his way in, they would say, you will promise to abide by the rules now, or we won't allow you to come back in as the 21st owner. And I don't know, maybe we should do that too when people can't abide by the rules in this country to allow people out of the country to not abide by the rules. The solution is to to deal with it. You know, some people want to call it tough love. It's called enforcing the laws. Um, I think we ought to get more punitive. It's kind of like prostitution. Um, they used to go after the prostitutes. And the prostitutes, pimps would bail them out. They'd get the attorneys and all that. And finally, they started going after the the, uh, the Johns. Uh, so the police women, sexy ones, would dress up and go out and solicit because they couldn't stop prostitution by going after the prostitutes. They had to go after the Johns. We get funny sometimes on how we deal with things. Is the John committed a crime because somebody had something for sale and he wanted to buy it? So I don't know. We get we get kind of tangled in in our relationship with our responsibilities as, as members of a, a country. Well, I mean, I don't really see how the tragedy of the commons could be applied here. I mean, I mean, all I see is just different levels and different forms of trespass. I mean, for instance, you know, these mainline libertarians, and when I say mainline libertarians, what I mean are generally speaking, uh, guys who vote for the capital L Libertarian Party or the LP. The LP, of course, suffers from partygarchy, but that's a discussion for another time. Um, but yeah, these mainline libertarians who are usually, you know, straight ticketed L voters, uh, <laughs> if they were to practice what they preach, Gary, I kind of suspect that they wouldn't be too appreciative if one of the illegals, you know, went into their living room, their kitchen, their bedroom. And I'm saying, like, best case scenario, which would be, I'm not saying the illegals have to smite them or, or be mean or bully. I'm just saying something akin to, like, what the Third Amendment is supposed to prevent, you know, quartering of troops or something equivalent of that. Obviously, I'm not saying the illegals are troops, but it's the same principle. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, trespass is bad. So I, I don't see why, uh, I don't know, it just seems a little bit of a contradiction to me. I got a uh, experience. Back in 1969, uh, I'd been busted for possession of pot in Florida and got a job surveying uh, for a Florida outfit. And uh, that job ran out, and so I looked in. I, I don't even remember where I looked, but I found a job in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I thought it was better since I'd been busted, which was an uncomfortable thing back then for possession of marijuana back in '69. Uh, so I went to Pittsburgh. Uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, you got a job up, up there as a photogrammetrist, uh, reviewing aerial photographs. We were basically identifying power poles over all of Ohio. Um, 
then I got busted up there for, uh, I was living in what's called a dwelling building. It's an old, it was like all these different houses, but they broke them up. And so, not houses, uh, but a house within a building. East floor had six living units on it. The living units had the kitchen bedroom, uh, two or three bedrooms, a uh, couple bathrooms, dining room, living room, everything. But because of the change in nature of the living up there, these were broken up into cells. And so the one I was in had three people living in it. It was called a dwelling building anyway. And I got busted for possession of marijuana there too, which got me kicked out of there. So when I got out of jail, after a couple of days, a friend bailed me out. I had gone to the pizza pub, a place in Shady Side, and was talking to people. I need a place to live. Anybody help me? And this one guy said, well, I've got a place. And so uh, he said, come on over and you can see it. Well, what he had is a carriage house, and there were a couple guys living in it now, but it, again, had been divided up into three uh, bedrooms in a shared uh, living area. Uh, this guy that had invited me lived in the front house with his family. And I went over there and looked at the place. Said, I like it. Yes, I'll rent it. And... Uh, so I sat down and explained. He said, I said, you know, I got busted for possession of marijuana. I haven't gone to court yet, but I want you to understand this. And he's a liberal. He said, I smoke pot too and, and all this stuff. And he, no problem. Um, you know, I think we got to have the right to smoke marijuana. And he just went on and on and on. So I paid the rent and moved in. Uh, two days later, he asked me to move out. And I said, why? He said, well, you know, it kind of puts my family at risk because the police might be watching you. Is that the kind of person you're talking about? <laughs> yeah, wow, that's uh, it's quite revealing just how fast he was willing to uh, turn tailcoat like that. Right. Wow. So in one afternoon, I went to work the next day, came home that night. The next morning before I went to work, he said, I want you out by this afternoon. It was that quick. Two nights there. Gee whiz. So, yes, uh, that's the kind of guy you're talking about then. He was, I, I think he would be considered a libertarian. Uh, he wasn't a Democrat or a Republican. I think he was probably a libertarian. I don't, didn't ask his politics. But, um, yes, uh, that's do as I say, not as I do. I know what a good example is just because I'm not one. I know what a good example is. I've met a lot of people like that, but that one sticks with me because I just got, I moved, I didn't have much. I moved it in there and I was comfortable. Now I should just go to work, make some money, pay off the, the debts I'd occurred while I was in jail and, you know, get back on a good track. And I had the rug pulled out from me so quickly. And it was devastating. And I had to find a place to stay that night. So some friends at uh, the pizza pub up in Pittsburgh, uh, I stayed with the, some of them for a while and then you know, got passed around. Let me put it that way. They were all nice people. They were hippies. They weren't libertarians. Um, and finally, I found another place and moved into it and, you know, got settled in. But it was emotionally kind of disruptive. So I can only imagine. Wow. So that's the, you know, yeah, we should, uh, libertarians, you know, if we have laws, we should enforce the laws unless I feel that the law shouldn't be enforced. And this is basically what this guy said. But then he decided it should be enforced when it affected him directly, and he had a little time to think about it. Uh, so let's say the Mexican comes across the border illegally. That's okay. Let's say the Medi Mexican camps on just 10 acres. Well, that's not okay because that's affecting me directly. And that's kind of like what they did in in, in a perspective that relates to the border crossings. When it has a detrimental effect on them, the world changes. Even if it's a perceived effect, then their 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 rigid line becomes very flexible, like butter. Hmm. But you know, trespass is trespass, and I think uh, anywhere in the world. People recognize what trespass is. I don't know about Africa, um, but I have an idea that if you go to any of the Middle Eastern co countries, uh, I, I don't know about China. I can't speak to that. But if we go to 
uh, Russia, if we go to, well, uh, Russia has yes, private ownership. Now we go to Europe, we go to even South America. Uh, trespass is going on some property owned by others. Now, in this country, we have what's called public lands. That means it belongs to me, it belongs to you, and we should have a right to use it, which we used to have freely in this country. You could spend, uh, uh, unless there was a specific use, you could camp out on, when I was a kid, you could pa- camp out on any public land, state or federal. It means just go out and put your tent up. But now they want a fee, even if it's remote and doesn't even have a place for you to drop the fee. And this, I ran into Aguila, Arizona. There's a, a little, a rock. It's called Eagle Eye. Uh, it's right off the uh, south side of Highway 60, just south of Aguila, about three miles. And you can see it from Aguila on Highway 60. And we used, to, you know, for my parents moved out there back in the 80s. And I used to go out there and I'd always go, it's 600 feet from the desert floor up to the eye. And the eye is kind of a tunnel. Uh, you know, it, it, it's eroded through there. It's fairly large. large it's about 40 feet across and about uh, uh, 12 feet high at the highest. Uh, but climb up there, and it's rugged climb, pretty challenging, and go up there and enjoy myself, take some pictures, and then go back down. And then one time after the Internet came up, sometimes in the probably late 90s, I went on the – it was Arizona state land, public lands. And I went on the Internet and looked up Eagle Eye to see if they had anything on it, trying to find – Anything, you know, a little history or a little interesting information, and found out that I was supposed to pay a $15 day use fee to walk out there. To go on that property, I was supposed to pay $15 day use fee. Well, needless to say, I never went and find the box that I put the fee in, but, uh, and continued to go up there. In fact, my, uh, Mother and stepfather's ashes, we went up there and spread the ashes up in Eagle Eye, uh, overlooking where they live there. But uh, the absurdity in this whole shift in, in how we look at public lands and, and trespass, and how can you trespass on what, what's yours unless there's specifics to it? And that specific isn't just $10. They say on the page, too, it said, we need this to keep the area clean. This goes to the expense of maintaining the area and keeping it clean. You go on there, and there's beer cans, uh, shotgun casings, uh, trash, boxes, toys, all kinds of shit on this land. And I don't think that the uh, state of Arizona has ever even gone up there to see how nasty it is. They just want to collect the money. But trespass is trespass. If it's mine, if you encroach upon my life, uh, or my real, in this case, we're talking about real property. If you encroach on my real property without my consent, you're trespassing. Now, in some, most states, it's understood that it has to be marked. And even then, there are exceptions, and we can get into that. But this gives you an idea historically uh, how the concept of tra- trespass was considered. Once posted, then nobody's supposed to be able to go on it unless they have proper business obviously the mailman can but uh in florida i'm a surveyor was i'm retired now uh we had to have easements for the uh, some power companies when when customers got nasty wanted an easement not just down the property line but from their transformer to the point of entry on the house for an easement so that they really had legal permission to repair the line that they were responsible for uh, it used to be assumed that that was blanket. If you got electrical service, they could come on your property to maintain the, the meter or a downed wire from the meter back to the pole. But th- attorneys got involved and things got touchy, and so they started requiring the easements to cover the land so that they could walk in there and, and replace their own meter or fix the meter if it was broken. That was implied before then. But if they had structures on it, like a transformer or underground lines, they had to have an easement. That was permission to trespass, the easement, for a specific purpose. Um, But if you didn't post your property back 20, 30 years ago, somebody could walk on your property. They could walk up to your door. But theoretically, in some states, walking to your door can be a crime, and one of those is uh, Wyoming, uh, and I'll get to that in a little while. Um, 
but trespass was going without permission, intruding in, uh, in my life. You know, there's an old saying that uh, your freedom ends at, uh, d- just before my nose. Uh, and that basically is it. When you cross that line to my nose, you have trespassed upon me. It's not just walking on something necessarily. Um, when I go, get up to Wyoming now, um, when I, I, I got a job up there, but due to circumstances, I chose not to take it. The circumstances are taking gas out of the ground, water tables going down. There's yellow clouds were uh, in uh, where I was going to be uh, working, and I decided after doing a little research that I didn't want to live there. But when I was up there talking to this survey company, and I was going to be office manager in one of their offices, uh, Pinedale, uh, Wyoming, and uh, they uh, they took me around to they had offices all over the state, and I went to all the offices and met the people there. But one thing they had in each office is one or two people whose sole job was to get permission. Now let's go back to Florida for a minute. Florida's sectionalized land except what was in land grants, uh, Spanish land grants, which were preserved intact. Sectionalized land is where surveyors go out, and this all occurred back in the eight, mid to late 1800s, and uh, they lay out under Jefferson's plan sections of land and townships of land, the section being one mile square with corners being set on the mile and half mile. Uh, then there's 36 sections, so six miles by six miles is a township. Um, those section corners, though, are necessary to be located to determine the boundaries of property anywhere close to it, within a, within a half a mile of it. Anything within a half a mile, those section corners become necessary to determine their value, to determine where other property lines are, especially when it gets down to 40-acre and 10-acre parcels. So in Florida, surveyors statutorily had the right to trespass so long as they didn't cause any damage and they did not have to notify the owner of the property the law was the, the law granted them the right to trespass for the purpose of conducting a survey now when i was up in wyoming i found out that wasn't true up there it was sectionalized just like florida was but if i wanted to go to a section corner if it was 15 feet off the public right of way i would have to get permission from that property owner in writing to go out and survey that corner, to measure to it and, and locate it. So Montana had, and you know, maybe the Wild West days or something, uh, and cattle rustlers and everything, for some reason they implemented a law that you can't even go on there to the public land monument, which is what it's called, the section corner, uh, without permission of the owner. That's a very rigid rule against uh encroachment so presumably then if i was a vacuum cleaner salesman or a sewing machine salesman and i wanted to go see the uh, lady of the house that if i walked off the road onto their property uh, that i would be trespassing i'm not sure if it goes that far but based on what i saw as far as uh, uh, accessing that public land corner uh, presumably the limitation on trespass is absolute up there, fenced or not. Unlike Florida, if it was posted in Florida, I still had the right, but nobody else did. If it wasn't posted, I could go on the land in Florida. There was no no limitations. As long as I wasn't destructive, you can't destroy other people's property. So it varies from place to place. But uh, conceptually, too, well, if I can't go on the land, uh, when Jefferson devised the sectionalized land system, it was revised over the years. There were a, uh, the manual for the instruction of the survey of public land. It was introduced back in the late 17 or early 1800s. It's been revised over time, but by the uh, fairly early 1800s, they'd established a, a concept that carried throughout. And that concept was this. Section 16 goes to public schools. It would be turned over. That's one square mile out of 36. uh, For uh, local people, for the purpose of school or education, which means they could sell it, they could put the school on it, they could put the school on it and sell part of it. But they had 640 acres that allowed them to use that resource to develop a, a public school system. They also... Uh, there, uh, that section, that one mile square is nominally subdivided into, 
uh, first 160 acre parcels being one quarter of the 640, and then into 40 acre parcels, uh, again, subdivisions, uh, in both directions of those 160 acre parcels. Now, it varied over time, but at least the quarter sections, which were on the half miles, uh, even though they left the line of the section and went north a mile to the other section line that was surveyed, they had a road right away, 30, usually half a chain, 33 feet on each side of that line. That was for public roads. Some states, some instructions, peri uh, periods of time that the surveys were done, even, did the same thing, either 33 feet or 16 and a half feet on each side of the 40 acre lines so that every parcel had access to a public road. So they created a grid and they had roads so every parcel abutted a public road. Um, that was because of these laws of trespass and if I bought something that wasn't on a public road, I couldn't get to my property. So the accommodation was to make sure that I could get to my property without trespassing on somebody else's property. Now, without going into detail, there's things called prescriptive rights that will grant use over a period of time. But the concern over trespass uh, was uh, there, uh, and the solution to trespass was created by creating these roads. They're called, called paper roads. They don't exist in reality. But if I buy the land there, I have a right then to go and prove that road to the extent that I need to get to my property. So the concept of trespass exists. Now, from what you told me in a conversation a few days ago, these people feel that the right to travel, which they feel that they can travel anywhere they want. I don't know if they respect, a, like in Florida, respect a fence that says no trespassing uh, or uh, a sign that says uh, those found uh, trespassing at night will be uh, found here at night will also be found here in the morning and a picture of a shotgun. Uh, where the line is drawn on what they think their right to travel includes. But let's go back to what a public road is. And this concept goes back over a thousand years in England. Um, uh, that one I'm familiar with. Obviously, it doesn't go back a thousand years in this country, but um, it's called a public right of way. And the public right of way belonged to the people collectively. And, you know, our history from the Constitution on has respected this concept of public right of way. So my right to travel allows me to travel on that right of way. It doesn't allow me to trespass on your land. I am one of the co-owners by being one of the public that goes on this land, uh, that, that owns this public land. Uh, Florida, for example, had a law that no public right of way can be closed for, uh, for more than 24 hours for any reason unless the governmental authority granted specific permission. So they were the, the government was the caretaker of this land. And if they were doing road construction, they actually had to vote how long they were going to close that road for the construction. Otherwise, they could close it for 24 hours, open it up, and then close it the next day and back and forth. So the expedient practical one is this board can uh, approve closing it for a period of time. Since it belonged to me, they couldn't say that I couldn't go on it. Now, if it's a public right-of-way or it's public lands, the same applies. If it's public lands, I had a right back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, sometime into the 60s, almost anywhere in this country to be able to go on public land, state or federal public land, because I was co-owner just like I was of the public road. But the extent of the right to travel is to the roadways and the public lands. It's not to private property. That private property is is sacred. It's yours to do with as you choose. Now, um, there are gray areas. We go from Wyoming down to Florida. In Florida, I have no problem, no concern at all walking up and knocking on somebody's door. Um, that's not trespass because they have a walkway. And they have a front door, and they, the walkway goes from the road to the front door. It's implied that I can walk up there and knock on their door. If they have a gate, that might be another question. Uh, but if they didn't post it in Florida, theoretically, I can go to the gate. That's to keep the dog in, but I, you know, I risk myself with the dog if there is a dog there. But unless it's posted, I, that, 
the implied access through that walkway, going to the public road, said I could go knock on the door. Doesn't mean I can walk around the house or anything. Uh, but the right of, uh, the, the concept of trespass says that we own this. This is mine. And that's ours. And uh, what's ours, we share. What's mine is mine. And that's, you know, kind of goes back to this Mexican border crossing stuff. Uh, what's ours is ours. It's not theirs. Any more than theirs is ours. And obviously you can't go to Mexico and just, uh, you can't sink into Mexico. They'll throw you in jail if you get caught with a rifle. If you're a Marine, I think this happened a couple months ago. A Marine happened to have a rifle in his car, and he crossed the border. And I think he, I didn't read the whole thing, but I think he had it in the car and didn't realize it was there, or at least that's the story he gave. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, but he was arrested and put in jail, and he got released finally after political pressure. Now, these people coming the other way, they bring guns and things like that, but we don't treat them the same way that they treat us. Um uh, so this concept of trespass has to have some constraints on it, whether it be traveling across my property or on the public right-of-way, whether it be crossing the border into my country or uh, staying in their own country. Uh, the, the right of travel in the, uh, is limited to traveling, and the right of access, the right of uh, to trespass is very limited, and it varies from state to state, but become, can become quite severe, like Wyoming, or uh, where it has to be uh, well established by fencing and signage in Florida. So did we cross that ground you wanted to cross with that? Well, I think this is, you know, listen to you right now, I think this is pretty much the impasse that I think the LP sycophant are running up against, which is, you know, the eternal dichotomy between the individual and the, you know, you mentioned earlier, would they respect, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, property rights vis-a-vis if they had a passing sign? Yes, they would. They've said it many times. Uh, however, that is on the level of individual property rights. The issue with the uh, the, <laughs> as they would say, the undocumented aliens uh, scampering across the border. Oh, well, that doesn't violate property rights. This is their reasoning. The reason it doesn't violate property rights is supposedly because the government doesn't actually own anything. And thus, when they scamper across public lands, it's not trespass because it's supposedly government property they don't own. I mean, that, that's kind of the other problem, too, is that they're equating public with government property, as public property with government property. Right there for now. Keep your other questions in mind. Let's go back and look at that. Now, uh, what I've explained before is common sense, with the exception of the rigidity of it in Wyoming. I think that's bullshit, at least as far as being a surveyor and needing access to those corners. And there's a legitimate access there because I can't survey somebody else's boundary without measuring that corner. But let's look at what you just said. Who owns that land, the government or us? Let's go back to what public is. Public is the people. You, you have access to Webster's 1828. While we're talking, why don't you look up peop, uh, public? Okay. But um, to say it, the government owns it, that therefore nobody owns it, is absolutely wrong. The concept of ownership in this country is absolute, and it's absolute to the point, and if you live in any state, they apply property taxes. Whether valid or not, and that's a whole other subject, and I'm not going to go there, Every bit of land in this country is taxed unless it belongs to a church, the government, or a non-exempt agency, or an exempt agency, or exempt party, schools, things like that. So um, if the government sells you that land and you pay for it, then you assume they have the right to sell it to you. Now, face it, all the land in this country was owned by the government somewhere along the line and was sold into private ownership or transferred into private ownership by various means, deeds, patents, and other means. And this goes back to, you know, 1776 and the, the, the grants that were given for service in the, the, the uh, military. If the government didn't own that land in western Virginia, how could they possibly grant it to somebody else? Now, let's not get into the ending argument on this. Either, but there was a presumption that the government owned the land. Owned, owned, owned the land. They owned it on behalf of the public. Therefore, if it was sold, that money 
that was received as a result of that sale went to the government to offset the expense of government. Makes sense. Back to Section 16. Public school could build their school there. They didn't need 640 acres. They didn't need a one-mile square to build a public school. But they could sell portions off to come up with the money to build the school and to pay the teacher. And that that 640 acres back then would probably go a, a long way, many years into the future, to build a school and pay a teacher who needed maybe an acre uh, to have a schoolhouse on. So that left... Uh, 639 acres to be sold for revenue. But there has to be ownership. Because if there's not ownership, it can't be conveyed to ownership. If no ownership didn't exist, I can't go down and buy it and say, now I own it because nobody had the right to sell it to me. So the presumption is everything's owned. And what keeps you from owning it? It's happened a lot in the 30s. Well, I do have that uh, definition for you. This is according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Uh, the word, first definition for the word public is pertaining to a nation, state, or community, extending to a whole people as a public law, which binds the people of a nation or state, as opposed to a private statute or resolve, which respects an individual or a corporation only. Thus to say, public welfare, public good, public calamity, public service, and public property. So it extends to the whole people. Yeah, in fact, actually, the Latin root, which is publicus, mean, is translated to English, meaning from the root of the populace, that is the people, or otherwise people-like. So it doesn't say to the government. It doesn't say government explicitly. You know, it does say state several times, that's true. Uh, but uh, but the emphasis is on the nation, the community, and the people. That's what the emphasis and the definition is about. I don't want to get into the definition of state, but under state, uh, understand that the state has different connotations as well. And since they didn't right. say government, but they did say the whole of the people, and the root is uh, the people, then obviously something public belongs to, collectively to all the people. And yes. that's the concept of right away. Does it just belong to the people? And a public right-of-way in Kansas, does it mean somebody from Missouri can't travel on that road? No. It's a public right-of-way, so it's the whole of the people. Does it mean an illegal alien can't travel on that road? I'm sorry, an undocumented alien. Well, I guess I could take my undocumented rifle and take care of that problem. But if they're a guest in this country properly, they're a guest then of the public, and they have a right to use that road. If they're illegal... They're as illegal as they are on that road as they are on your private property over the fence. They have trespassed. They don't belong here. So I think it's clear that public is not government. We've just been led to believe that uh, over the last uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Or, you know, I think that's about it. Probably 60 years is as far back. You go back before that, and I think public land was uh, recognized as public land. Mm. Any more definitions in there that would help? So. Uh, let me check. Uh, second definition is common to many, current or circulated among people of all classes, general as public report or public scandal. Um, yeah, actually, skipping down to the sixth definition, it says open to common use as a public road. Oh, there you go. Absolutely. Common use. That's the collective as a public road. And that would apply to a public land as well, I would presume, because we can't change the definition of public uh, when we apply it to road uh, or when we apply it to land. It has to have the same meaning if it's used in the same context in terms of ownership. And I th is there another one that might be supportive of this? Uh, the fourth definition was regarding the community directed in the interest of the nation, state, or community, uh, such as public spirit, public mightiness, opposed to private or selfish. Okay. Oh, actually, oh, here's another one, actually. This might be better. Seventh definition. In general, public expresses something common to mankind at large, to a nation, state, city, or town, and as opposed to private, which denotes what belongs to an individual, to a family, to a company, or even a corporation. Okay, so when we look at that one, it said at large, but it did set limits immediately after that. The nation, the state, or the, what, community? City and city or town, yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, so that means it doesn't belong to the Mexicans too. <laughs> I never thought of it that way before. Well, that's what it says, the nation. I mean, you you got to have boundaries on it. Until there's a one-world nation, obviously the national boundaries have purpose. That's why they put uh, checkpoints at the border crossings. And now you have to have a passport to go to Mexico or Canada, which you didn't used to have to have. Uh, that's why there was a wall through the middle of Berlin. Uh, that's why there are very rigid checkpoints between many nations that aren't friendly to each other. Uh, for example, East and West Germany until the wall came down and uh, Germany was reunified. Uh, oh, the division line between North and South Korea, you know, that's pretty uh, distinct. And I don't think a South Korean has any right to, uh, to tread upon North Korean public rights of way without getting shot. So, you know, the the concept is there, and it is limited to the public being confined to a body of people, as, uh, or a body politic is defined there. Uh, let's say we had a state park in, I'm in California, in California, um, and there there was a, 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 sorry I can't give you the site, but I remember reading years ago there was a site that uh, had to do with fish and game, and that was, and I, it wasn't in California, but I'm going to use California to demonstrate the principle of the uh, Supreme Court decision, um, that California cannot charge Californians to hunt deer in California or to fish in California. However, now this has been changed over time because of the fisheries and, and uh, the proliferation of rangers walking around with guns, uh, and they had to support them, but they could charge somebody from another state to hunt or fish in California because that was the California domain, therefore it belonged to the people of California. So now we see in that application a re restriction or a confinement to the public being limited to California. It did not apply to roads, but it applied to parks and public lands where you could fish and hunt. Now, is it possible then that if there's a city park, a public city park, that only people in the city could go in there? I think it's conceivable, although I've never heard of somebody – saying that uh, somebody from a different town couldn't use that park to go have lunch at a picnic bench. But uh, what we have seen is just a big leap where they close public parks, parks at night, presumably for our own safety, as if we can't protect ourselves. Well, there's probably a reason for that, too. But it used to be public parks were open all the time. Uh, they were public parks. They didn't put gates and fences around public parks. They didn't put cops out there to keep you off the public land. But now, see, this goes along with this transition of the misconception of the word public, which uh, means the people, not the government. We have been led to believe that the government controls this. Now, if the government is not going to prosecute people going on public roads or public lands when they're coming from another country, uh, we tend to, or the libertarians, people like that, must tend to assume that the government, if they're not going to enforce it, it's not enforceable, even though the law says it should be enforced. Does that make sense? Did I get it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I, I think the other crux of the issue, too, is really kind of going back to that, that economy about the individual versus the collective. And in this context... Uh, the, the, I guess you could say the legitimacy of individual property ownership versus collective property ownership. You know, just in going with property rights in general, I mean, they, I mean, when you start starting a ground zero with property rights, it doesn't necessarily make that distinction between individual or collective ownership. But, um, well, common, you know, like for example, doesn't common sense, if we all own it, we can all use it, uh, individually or collectively. But if one individual owns it, he can use it individually or collectively. Well, the libertarians always have said that uh, that collective property ownership suffers from the tragedy of the commons. Therefore, that's why individual property ownership and and use and rights and all that is always superior and morally sound and the rest of it. I mean that they always appeal to the tragedy of the commons every single time that's come up. So let's that, that just brought to mind something: the Boston Commons, where the liberty was. Uh, in the Liberty Pole and a number of events back in the 1700s. Uh, Paul Revere had a shop there, though, and the front of his shop was open to people, the public, because he was 
in a commercial enterprise selling silver and doing art, uh, printing and, uh, minor printing and, and, uh, repair work and things like that. But can they go beyond the counter? Do they have a right to go beyond the counter when they go in the shop? What, what is accessible immediately from the public road, the front of the shop, presumably can be trespassed upon so long as the door is not locked, which is an indication that you're not allowed. But the Boston Commons, anybody could go down there any time. Even the British soldiers uh, did their parade on the uh, uh, Commons. So, and maybe that sets the distinction that as long as I allow access from the public road, uh, you can come in there. But when you want to come behind the counter, you can't go there. That is private. That is trespass when you cross that line. Well, I mean, I, I know that they usually emphasize about the homesteading principle, literally where you take a un- like an unowned piece of, well, the analogy they always use is unowned, you know, land, real property, and you basically develop it, like in the case of a subsistence farmer, for instance. And even though, even if you don't get a title from some sort of governing authority, such as government or the state, um, it's still your property because you homesteaded it. So you homesteaded it into existence, therefore you have property rights to it. Well, but of course, all of that is usually done in the context of individual property rights. I've never seen a libertarian justification for homesteading for a bunch of people to collectively homestead something unowned beforehand, then they have collective property rights. I've never seen an example like that. And there's nobody with any authority to convey it, is there? Uh, let's look at the Homestead Act. Homestead Act had boundaries and they had procedures. You had to fall. You had to register. They gave you flags. You had to stake the four corners as, as best you could. Uh, there have been a number of Homestead Acts. There have been other times where land was opened up for purchase. You go stake your claim, had it surveyed. Uh, then you paid $3 an acre or something like that and recorded your claim. And in both cases, the Homestead and these other purchases, you had to do improvements on them. You had to do a certain amount of improvements in a certain period of time, and finally the, the title uh, inured, and you became the fee title ownership of it. But never was it open to any land that you wanted to settle on. So the, the term squatting came from the fact that you don't aren't abiding by the rules. But if we don't expect the Mexicans to abide by the rules, why should people in this country abide by the rules? If the money that, that $3 an acre, for example, uh, was going to go to the Treasury to offset the debt of the country or the operating expense of the country, uh, if I go in and homestead and claim this land, uh, I've just stolen $3 an acre from everybody else, haven't I? I guess that's one way of looking at it. Uh, they're denied. Somebody owes you $18 for six acres, and uh, he doesn't pay you. Does he own the land if he bought 18 acres at $3 an acre? Or six acres at $3 an acre. If he doesn't pay you, does he own the land? They call it foreclosure when it comes to real property uh, and banks. And, com- and and that's actually commercially. But uh, the concept is there that uh, you have an obligation. Because otherwise, you just say, hey, I'll give you $18 for that six acres of land. And then I move on and I build a house. And I say, fuck, uh, screw you. I'm not going to pay you. Um, I've just stolen that land valued at $3 an acre from you. I have denied you what is owed to you based on a promise that I made. Uh, going back to this libertarian concept that you're suggesting, uh, let's just say you got 160 acres and you live down in the southeast corner of that, and I go in on the northwest corner and I put up some fences and I cut some trees down, and you don't notice it because it's too far away. It's a half mile away, and I don't know what's happening up there. I haven't been up there in years. And, and you go make all these improvements, and I go, go up there and say, hey, that's my land. Oh, no, uh, you know, I've, I've improved it. I own it now, and, and I've stolen it from you. How else can you look at that? Well, I guess the other way of looking at it would be that, uh, you know, if, if I was. Wait, wait. Is there any difference now if it's my 160 acres or that 160 acres belongs to all of us collectively, public land? Is there any difference?
Well, if I had owned beforehand that 160 some odd acres and then and for some or excuse me, if I had homesteaded originally, but I failed to set up fencing or put up signs or somehow develop it to the degree where someone could tell that it was owned and then someone comes in and settles a quarter of it, you know, that's one thing. But if I failed to do that, um, you know, the onus would be on me. And I couldn't claim I lost the property. But, of course, then again, I mean, the whole homesteading thing really does kind of depend. You got your really. There were requirements set. There was a legal description prepared of your property, and you uh, followed procedure and followed the rules. And the improvements don't include necessarily fencing. They, you know, growing crops, uh, uh, ranging cattle, building a house, those are the improvements that were necessary to tr- to show that you were going to make use of the land. didn't require fencing the whole thing. Now, you had to follow the rules, and those boundaries were 40-acre uh, or 160-acre. Usually in the homestead, I think it was 160 acres. So it's a quarter of a section, and you followed the rules to acquire that property. Now, this other guy comes along, and he says, screw the rules. I like this corner of this guy's property, whether I know he owns it or not. He didn't follow the rules. He's trespassed. If I see a vacant house, can I move into it because nobody's living there? Well, it, well, if it's abandoned property, and and, a pre, and ideally, if you know for certain it's abandoned, then I don't see any reason initially why not. But if your example is... The fact that they're not living there does not discharge their right of ownership, doesn't it? Well, but again, it would kind of depend on the basis of property rights. I mean, in, in your other example... Where I have title to the, if I heard you right, if I have title to the land, i.e. the government recognizes that I own it and they're willing to protect my property, at least claim they do, then someone who moves it on the, on, on like the corner of my property, okay, well that's a different story altogether. Well, I can see a, a kind of a misunderstanding, so let me go a little further as a surveyor. There is not an inch of land, well, I can't say that. There is not a, a significant parcel of land in this country that doesn't have a legal description attached to it. There may not be markers out there, but, for example, let's take a section of land. If I buy the southeast quarter of the, of the section or get it granted to me one way or another, homestead or anything else, there are three corners set. The I'm in the southeast quarter of the section. I have my southwest corner, my southeast corner, and my northeast corner. But my northwest corner has never been set because they never went through the section. But it can be defined. And my, as a surveyor, often my job was to define that northwest corner of the property. But everything is de- described by description. It's not just that the land's there. It's by description. It's called the Torrens Land uh, System. And what it's based upon is recording in in public records. So every county in the state has a uh, record of deeds, and they have what they call a grantor-grantee index. The initial grantor most often is the United States government. Sometimes it's the state, but once it comes into public ownership, that land can be subdivided and distributed out, but it's all described. So whether you see the lines on the ground when you go take my northwest uh the northwest corner of my property or not, it's described, and it's mine. So you can't presume that just because I like this land, you have an obligation to assure that you're not on my property. Now, let's assume that you bought the uh, southwest corner of the section by a grant, and by mistake, by error, you built at my nor- northwest corner on my property, and you'd lived there for 10 or 15 years, and we've been neighbors. Something's called adverse possession comes into play when there's reasonable right to a uh, re- reasonable cause to assume that you, that you own that land when you built your house on my property. It's called adverse possession. And it has to be open and notorious. So you can acquire the land of another party by what's called open and notorious possession. But it, the the length of time varies from state to state. But you can't do it on public land because they, unlike you, are not occupants of the land. It belongs to all of us, and you can't trespass on all of our land that the government is the caretaker of because we can't patrol it all. But in this case, where you built your house on my 
at, at on my, the northwest corner of my property. It's up to me to protect my property. You go a certain period of time. Generally, I think it's about 15 years, and you've occupied that for 15 years. And then I say, get a survey done, and I say, hey, you're on my property. Well, I've been here for uh, 15 years, so you lose. So it goes to court, and the laws of the state are like Florida. Then that 15 years, the title secures to me, so or to you. You you own my property at that point through adverse possession. But you can't do that to public land any more than uh, just say one of those 66-foot uh, right, 30 feet on each side roads. If you build your house on that road, you can't own that road because that's public, and they have a right to travel there. So you can park on my land for 15 years and get it, but you can't park on the road and get it because it belongs to all of us. And we can't be expected to go out and see where that 66 feet is and inspect every time somebody puts up a house, say, uh now, I'm going back a few years because now the, the roads are pretty well established in most places. Uh, but since we can't go out, uh, they're, they're, you know, when you've got hundreds of millions of acres, you can't go out and inspect everything every year to make sure nobody's, or even every 15 years to make sure nobody's encroaching. So you cannot adversely possess public land, but you can adversely protect private land because it's presumed the private owner has an obligation to protect his property. And they allow 15 years, plenty of time, almost a generation, to, to make sure that we protect that property. So these make sense. That eventually it goes to you if I don't say something about it, eventually. Because you've openly and notoriously possessed it. And if you put a fence up in conjunction with going on my property, that fence becomes the boundary. If you don't put up a fence, the area that I use, that I mow, that I cut trees out of or something like that would be the defined boundary in most cases. So that's common sense. Now let's apply common sense. You give me a situation and let's see where the common sense comes in. Is it parking on my land or public? Well, I mean, how it was described to me way back when was that homesteading basically unowned or even abandoned property would be pretty much done kind of like something equivalent to uh, like this, like the archetype of the Wild West, a kind of natural anarchic setting where there's no government, there's no public, there's just trees and stuff. And then you, kind of like in the case of westward migration, you and your family go there and you settle in, you grow the crops, you do, you build the house, you do everything, and because and set up the fencing and the rest of it, and then you homestead with the property. So that that's how it was always described to me, anyway. Well, not having spent that much time in the West surveying, I can understand back then when there was no county seat where I could go down and find out who owned the land. But if there's a county seat, I can go down to the records and say, is there any land available for homestead or any public land that I can secure? And there were, it varies again over time, but there was usually a way to buy public land almost anywhere. And it was bought. And once it was conveyed, it was re recorded in the, um, the the county records and the county records had maps showing where each parcel was. I mean, you can go down to your county now, and you can go back into the 1800s if the county's been around that long, and watch this whole chain of ownership. You can look at the 1800s maps if they're still available and see who owned what. They had deeds. They had pieces of paper saying, "This is my property." <laughs> if I went out and, and took some public land and then went down to the county to record that, the Torrens Land System, the proof of ownership, and recorded it. And went down to the recorder and said, I own this land up here. And the guy said, well, that belongs to the U.S. government collectively. You know, they're the caretaker. You have to talk to them, not us. Unless you have a deed, we're not going to put it on our map. So there has always been a way to check this out as long as there was a county. Now, you get back far enough Oregon Trail Day. Sometimes people just said, I'm tired. I'm not going to go any further. I like this little valley. I'm going to settle here. Those were recognized in the concept that you're talking about, but the land was remote back then. You didn't need a commercial license to set up a trading post and sell wagon wheels to people. But that was a unique situation. That was a settlement where you had the West Coast, a strip along the West Coast, and the East Coast, 
and a few lines between the two, sparsely populated, where this wasn't contested. But when a county got there, you had to secure your claim, which means you had to get a surveyor to come out and identify and write a description of the property. Now, if you go, uh, Bureau of Land Management was responsible for the records of the all the surveys in all the states. And if you go to the old records, what I said, uh, Spanish land grants in Florida were, you know, in, in California, New Mexico, Arizona, these Spanish land grants were recognized. So when they sectionalized the land and they came to the boundaries of the land grants, they stopped the sectional survey and said this land is already owned. Um, if you go into, say, Utah, and you find a, a homestead that's been there for 150 years, and you go back and look at the tax rolls there, I think you'll find when they came back later in the uh, to sectionalize Utah, which was done generally before statehood, sometimes it wasn't included until after statehood, uh, as in the westward expansion, you'll see on the map there that they ran across this irregular parcel that was fenced or otherwise marked out, and they separated that like they do the Spanish land grants and removed it from what's called the public surveys, the public land surveys, the, the sectional grid. So it's an intrusion. They don't change what they're doing. They pretend like the lines go through, but they go, draw what's called a meander line around this ownership, and that's taken out of the public lands. So there was recognition at the time. But once the land was sectionalized, at this point, and the whole reason for Jefferson's system is at this point we have a record of uh, recording ownership of land going to the, what's called the Torrens Land System and uh, identifying ownership. So there was that period of time in the Western Expansion that people were going through what was just territories at the time. Uh, there weren't county records. You, you could back then go occupy it. But right now, every bit of land in this country is described. It is mapped. And so now there is an indication of ownership on those maps, whether it be collective through the public lands for the federal government, the state government, or perhaps even the county. So it's mapped now. And you can't just go pluck your piece down because you pluck your piece down now, you're plucking it on somebody else's property. So what was good 150 years ago, if they can find a time machine, they can go back and stake their claim. But to realize that during expansion, well, look at it this way. Suppose you put up a soddy today and just dug a pit in the backyard to shit and piss in. You think they're going to buy that? I don't like the fact that they can tell you what you've got to do. But, no, you can't live in a soddy. You've got to have insulation on the walls. You've got to have R14 on the exterior and R20 in the ceiling. And you've got to have the electrical wiring and conduit. Wait a minute. I had a cow once that did not have electrical wiring in the conduit, and the inspector came and said, you've got to put this in a conduit. I said, this is grandfathered, and we talked a while, and he said, okay, we'll leave it. That was in Cal uh, California many years ago, back in the, who was it, about 70 or 71. Uh, but it was an old house. It was built in 1926 before they required the conduit. It was just Romex cable, and the Romex cable was kind of a black braided stuff with silver on it, and they didn't put it in conduits. They bored through the studs and ran this wire through. Uh, he wanted me to upgrade the whole house, but I talked him out of it. So things change over time, and we have to recognize that. I still think that I should be able to build a Saudi and live in it if I want to. I think the government has no obligation to protect me. However, when we get to land, we have to understand that when you've got raw land and it's not marked, nobody, nobody has set any markers of ownership that uh, you have a right to settle it, but that time is past. In this country, it passed a long time ago. I think all the public land surveys were com completed by the end of the 19th century. There might have been some that came afterwards. I know that Alaska was done much later, uh, but down in the 48 states, those uh, by the 1900s, I think they were all sectionalized or, or shortly thereafter. So, well, that would kind of beg the question as to uh, was where the uh, modern frontier is. You're breaking up. You want to repeat that? 
Yeah, sure. Well, I would kind of beg the question as to where the modern frontier would be. It? There is no frontier left. When they sectionalized the land, the government came in and marked it for conveyance. Prior to that, it was raw land. It belonged to the United States government because they bought it in some, most of it in what was called the Louisiana Purchase. They paid for it, but they bought it on behalf of the public, so it belonged to the public. But until Jefferson's system of sectionalized land was put into place and it could be marked for boundaries, and with the desire for westward expansion, people that came before that got it. That's just like if you bought land... Give you a good for instance. My parents bought a house in 1949. They paid eight uh, acre and a half, two story, one and a half story house in Rolling Hills, California. They paid eighteen thousand five hundred dollars for it. My mother and stepfather sold it in the early 90s for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Uh, a few years ago, I looked at uh, houses in the neighborhood. There's one just like ours, but the reverse that a friend of mine was raised in. And uh, its price was $1.2 million. Things change over time. Uh, land value goes up. Now, I believe the federal government should open up this uh, public lands and allow us to buy it at a, a nominal price. But they don't feel that way. And if we have restore constitutional government, if we look at the source of revenue available there uh, to offset the debt and get things back on an even keel as long as they get the spending back, there's enough land in this country to, to pay off that debt. There are hundreds of millions of acres. And if we look at, say, a price of $5,000 an acre, which is realistic nowadays, that's a hell of a lot of money. That would pay a lot of the debt off, wouldn't it? If it was more desirable, yeah. it would be worth ten, twenty, or 20000 an acre. Well, I mean, I heard rumors that supposedly – the USGS hasn't mapped out certain uh, portions of the United States, but I haven't had a chance to double-check that. So I don't know. Maybe that's the closest thing to a frontier. Uh, well, there's two kinds of mapping. U.S. Geological Survey makes quad sheets. And, yes, they've surveyed the entire country. And if you look on a U.S. Coast and Geodetic 15-minute quad, for example, you'll see – Red lines indicating the section lines where sectional line apply. If you see at the intersect of two of those red lines a heavy uh, cross, that means they found a section corner when they were doing these aerials. That was mostly done from aerial surveys. Uh, if you see halfway through a bold line halfway between two X's, that means they found that quarter corner. But every bit of this country has been mapped from a top, uh, topographic map, which is the U.S. Geological Survey's responsibility. The, the other survey, though, or the other map is the public land surveys, which is section maps. And, yes, every <laughs> Colorado, Wyoming, uh, California, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, everywhere I go, you will find, down at your county tax assessor's office, you will find a land that shows every inch of land in this country. So that public lands mapping is complete, even in Alaska. But in Alaska, they did something kind of irregular. They established wildernesses that they didn't go into they set that aside for perpetual ownership by the state of Alaska or the federal government. I'm not sure which. So those weren't surveyed, but all the habitable land, I mean, you're getting back into regions that are, you know, far from anything. But, yes, in the 48 states, and let's stick to that, uh, in the 48 states, every bit of it has been mapped under the public lands. Not uh, And it's all been mapped under the quad sheet program because it was done from aerial surveys, so they didn't have to go there to do it. Uh, aerial photography is kind of interesting. I was a photogrammetrist in the Army, and I've worked uh, a couple times in that same industry and then used it to supplement surveying many times since then. Uh, if I set up three points and give the XYZ value, northing, easting, and elevation, they can take a map and rectify it to that and come up with a fairly accurate representation. You can see it on Google Earth. 
uh, of of what the land is, elevation-wise and everything else. So, yes, this 48 states have been mapped to the, when I say to the ants, the ambiguities or the, uh, where there are discrepancies, hiatuses and overlaps are what they're referred to in surveying, uh, is where on the ground somebody thought a corner was here and they ran a line here and somebody else diverged from that, and there's an area of unowned land between the two based on what was Marked out. Now, this would not include the sectional lands. This would be in subdivision surveys. There's what's called a hiatus. Nobody owns. Uh, that can be resolved quite easily. There are other, just the opposite can occur where there actually overlaps, where the uh, two people by private surveys seem to think that their properties overlap each other. And, and those are the areas that are uh, contested and have to be resolved based on use and things like that, but there's not an inch in this country, rhetorically, that's not been mapped in the 48 states. Mm. So I guess, uh, no, it, it's not soon, huh? It's nice to think, you know, to support their argument, it's nice for them to uh, to think that it's not been mapped, that, but that's bullshit, and I know better than that. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess to bring it full circle, I hope that the the Mexicans get the political will to, to take care of their own uh, place so that, you know, that so that their, uh, the tyrant that they have to deal with, their economy is so roughshod into the ground that many of them have little to become uh, <laughs> informal expats. I mean, frankly, and then the worst part is that you know, it would be nice if they did something like Chiapas. Um, Zapatistas, and I would encourage them not to, but something along those lines of Chiapas. You know, it's not like they've got, it's, it's not like they can't say we don't have an historical precedent. They do, but they're not taking for getting control of um, what is supposed to be their own country. And they've got, and, you know, Mexico's got, last time I checked, they have like approximately triple the resource wealth of the United States. So, I mean, they, they have no excuses. Right, and we've sent many millions of dollars down there trying to help them develop those resources and uh, I don't know if it still does but I, I imagine for decades or over a century a lot of that money has gone into uh, people's pockets rather than where it should be but let's let's back to the point just for a second if if I have the fallacious understanding that um, this country's not been mapped and there's land that's not owned I guess I can have an equally fallacious argument that uh, people from other countries have as much right here because I haven't done my homework. I'm just shooting from the, the lip. Does that make sense? Hmm. If, it's, it's interesting. I've never really heard it postulated like that before. Well, they have no historical foundation. They have no concept of land ownership. To them, land ownership, uh, they go by, if they bought a house, if they've made enough in life to buy a house or land, uh, the realtor says, okay, your property goes from here to there to there to there, and that's your property. Oh, okay, that's it. That's all they know. And then they get a tax bill, and it's got some cryptic writing on there that says from the southwest corner and all this stuff, and they don't understand that. But they know that their land has been mapped, or they think it has, and it probably has, but they don't really know for sure. They just have all these words on paper, and they don't understand them. Legal descriptions are rather interesting documents. Um, but so the assumption that, uh, well, you know, if nobody lives on it, obviously they don't have a deed to it. Well, that's a presumption. I mean, I could have land and not use it. I could own it. The, the public can own, have land and not use it. If I bought 640 acres of sectional land and, uh, for my purposes, I only needed the southeast 160 acres of that for cattle and, and growing a few crops and everything, and I wanted to save the, the rest of it for future generations of my family, um, it might not be mapped. It might not be improved because I'm using all that I need now. But eventually, when the grandchildren get grown up, they might want some of this land for farming themselves. And to assume that it's not been mapped and not been cataloged 
is is false. It is all described. Now, the description might be Section 13, Township 22 North, Range 14 East, and that's one square mile. But a description exists that covers every inch of that land and every inch of land in this in the 48 states. Whether a deed's ever been issued or not is another question. But then if the deed's not been issued or a patent, then it still belongs to the public at large, and it doesn't give an individual right because the rules have been established on conveyance of the public lands to private sector. It doesn't give an individual to override those rules that were made collectively through the representation in accordance with the Constitution. Well, I mean, I – well, thank you for mentioning those things. I just – I don't know. I mean, there is some stuff that you know, that just rubs me the wrong way. And I know there are a lot of well-meaning guys who like to, you know, patrol up and down the southern border with their buddies uh, because they because they pretty much understand trespass, even if it's only on an intuitive level. Um but suffice it to say, uh, I really do think that the issue with, uh, with the locals really comes down to property rights. At the end of the day, it just does. And so, uh, let's go back to that first example we used. We bought this 10 acres. There's 21 of us. Now, some of the guys live in New York, some live in Florida, some live in Canada, even, you know, they're wherever they live. But there's two or three of us live down here in this town. And we see people coming in and camping on our land. Do we have a right to go say, get off of our land? It's collectively owned by the 21 people. Do we have a right to say, get off of our land? Well, I would assume so, yeah. Depends on if we're in Wyoming or Florida. However, once we fence that land, then that fence implies there's not a walkway through this fence. That fence implies do not cross this fence, doesn't it? It's open and notorious, to use an expression used in land. It's open and notorious. The property is fenced. If you climb that fence, you know that you're doing something you shouldn't do. That's what fences are all about, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, it's delineating between, yeah, even in the uh, privacy literature, there's, it's, it makes it between private and public spaces, yeah. Okay, now let me ask you another question. Along the southern border, it all all of it is fenced, except the thread down the middle of the Rio Grande. Uh, you know, that's not. Um, but it's all fenced. Now, some of it's rickety old barbed wire. The posts are rotting out. And other places, man, it's this phenomenal fence 28 feet high that they still manage to get over. But are they crossing a fence to come in this country? Is there any inch of that border that did, doesn't even have – or either have a border guard gate and roadways and walkways or a fence on it? Where do you think the term wetback came from? These guys grabbed that fence, went across the creek, and they swung down and under and then came up the other side. In their process, they're back, drug in the water, therefore they became wetbacks in crossing that fence under it instead of over it. This country's fenced. This property is fenced. Our 10 acres is fenced. To cross that fence is a breach of the ownership of the 21 people or the collective people of the United States. Which I think last time I checked was like over 300 people, yeah. Well, or, or Arizona. I mean, Arizona's got an obligation to, to, to protect its property as well. Now, the fact that Arizona doesn't because there are a lot of federal laws that really come into play that are rather interesting. For example, if and this went through with the SB 1070 and all this. When I was looking into why SB uh, 1070 didn't call them militia, I found out from Harper, the guy that initiated the bill, indirectly. I didn't talk to him, but a friend of mine asked him some questions for me. It was very interesting. He said, if we created a militia, the United States government, via the Constitution, can call that militia forward. That means if we created a militia, they could say, okay, we need those guys to go up to Arkansas and do this or something like that. And anybody in that militia that didn't follow that law, the, that call by the uh, Congress would be AWOL. So if we call it militia, we in a sense, uh, uh, let, let's call it a, an oversight in the Constitution, have given that body of men under arms to the federal government if they call them. 
however, if we call it a security, I forgot what they called it in SB 1070, uh, but on YHTOM uh, archive files at OPF radio page, uh, you'll find, I think, two programs on SB 1070. And we talked about it then when it was fresh in my uh, not-so-fresh mind. Uh, but they, they were creating a, a state defense force or something like that to keep the word militia out of it. And it made sense, because if it was a militia, the federal government can call it. It says so in the Constitution. So, now, if we are the militia but have to call ourselves something else, can we protect that property? Can you and I protect that 10 acres? Can we do it without the consent of the other people? Well, they gave consent when they put the fence up and said, do not cross this fence. So you and I can, without getting permission from the other 19, protect our 10 acres. Likewise, without getting permission, uh, can we protect that fence between us and Mexico? I believe we can. Now, if we commit a crime in the process, we're subject to prosecution under that crime. If we commit a crime. But I don't know anybody's been prosecuted for anything down there except making explosive devices, uh, actually booby traps. And I think a few people have been gone to trial and been convicted for making booby traps, but I don't know anybody that's been charged with the crime of protecting the border. Now, there was a group of people in Arizona that were crime, uh, accused of, of the crime of theft and murder by going into the house, killing some people, and stealing what they could out of the house that uh, I can't think of her name, that white haired girl was one of them. Uh, so if the crime's committed, yes, it's prosecutable. But if we're just defending the border or we fire back in self-defense, or at least we can convince somebody that we fired back in self-defense, um, I think we have every right to protect that border. And I think that's why you haven't seen patrols out there arresting patriots who were walking around trying to keep people from crossing that damn fence. Hmm. Okay. Well, then I guess the only other question, <laughs> hopefully this will be the last question, <laughs> but uh, well, at that point, I mean, how, how would one deal with uh, folks that don't recognize collective property then at that point? You mean people who think the world's still flat? <laughs> okay. They don't. They haven't looked into. They have assumed what they want to be true. I think I've. I think I have the uh, technical and professional background to speak as I have. I was a licensed surveyor in Florida. I did not renew my license when I started uh, going around the country investigating Waco and Patriot events. I've continued in surveying, however until just a few years ago, and I'm knowledgeable, and I'm good at what I do. I, I learned my trade, uh, my profession quite well. I used to teach surveying in Florida. I was certified by the state to teach surveying. So I know, you know, I have credentials. I'm a quote-unquote expert witness uh, in that regard. And so I know these things. So it's kind of, you know, we're talking about something that has to do with land and ownership and rights and things like that. I know what I'm talking about. Um, when somebody just guesses and, you know, watches, uh, say, Oregon Trail on black and white television and sees these people just settle and, oh, I'm going to claim this land and settle here, those days are past. We use rifles now. We don't use spears. The world has changed. You need to understand what the world is today to understand how it works. So if they want to shoot from the lip because they think it's true without doing the homework to determine how the land system in this country works, and it need not require the extent that I went through to do it. All they have to do is go down to the county recorder's office or the tax assessor's office and look at the maps, look at the deeds, and every deed will go back to the original source of ownership in those books, and it will be passed on. The grantor grantee index, if John Smith got it from the federal government under a land patent, that deed is there and recorded. And the grantor grantee dis, uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, list, you go on down and you find John Smith sold it to Sam Brown. And then you go on down and you'll see Sam Brown do, show, uh, sold it to Joe Wilson. There's a whole chain of title. When you used to buy real estate, you'd get a 
abstract of title. Nowadays, they give you title insurance. This is a, an attorney scam, and I, I don't know how many, in my years of surveying, how many errors I found in what's called the uh, uh, certificate, uh, uh, title insurance uh, because the, the, it's not an abstract and it doesn't have the record. And I had to review the records to find out what the real boundary was supposed to be. And I find out these attorneys make big mistakes. But what they did is they tried to shift the money from the title companies into their pockets by putting up these insurance companies. And I've seen them pay out hundreds of thousands of dollars because they made a mistake in the issuance of the policy. But in that that abstract, when you get an abstract, if, you, if you're going to go buy some land, uh, tell the people, I don't want title insurance, I want an abstract. Now, if you want to give me title insurance, too, fine, but I want an abstract. And you'll get a uh, blue cover bound book anywhere from four to, I've seen them, 20, 22 inches thick. And it's every record that pertains to that piece of land in the public records. And it will go back. Down at the bottom, you'll find a conveyance from the United States or the state or something that gave them that first owner original title of that land. And there's a grantor and grantee on that. Grantor gives, grantee receives. That's the grantor-grantee index. You will find the grantor more likely the United States government, perhaps the state, but it has to be, one, or perhaps the Spanish when they had control of the land, but there will be an original grantor, and there was a presumption of ownership on the part of the original grant, uh, grantor. The United States and the state did it on behalf of the people of the state or the United States for service or for fee, if it was Spanish, it was given by the King of Spain for services rendered. But everything had an original owner in this country, and the 48 states, every inch, is covered in that. Now, understanding that sim- mm, well. makes a lot of sense we come to a solution to the problem. Yes, there is ownership. No, there's nothing unmapped. Um, and yes, I can't go steal property from an individual any more than I can go steal property from the collective, the people, the public. Well, it's just, you know, I would be watching stuff on YouTube, admittedly, and there would be all these videos that of one flavor or another, usually libertarian or claim to be anyway, that would say, you know, freedom, freedom, you know, kind of getting high on the freedom juice. And then at the same time saying borders are an evil government constructed thing to prevent the right of travel. And it's awful. Borders need to be abolished. And a lot of it would contradict things that I had read about. So. Part of me was thinking that, you know, is this an effect of, uh, of the phenomenon of uh, because YouTube said so? And uh, talking to you tonight, I... Uh... Because YouTube said so. And let's, let, let's look at that. What I've been talking about, the public right-of-way, public ownership of lands, the Torrance land system, these things aren't new. They're not fantasies created in the last couple hundred years. These go back primarily we have adopted the English system. This goes back almost two, uh, two uh, centuries uh, <laughs> two millennia, almost two millennia. We go back to, say, six or 800 B, uh, A.D., and we start seeing uh, how ownership was established. Now, when I taught serving, I used to tell funny stories uh, based on truth and did the research, and I, unfortunately I've lost the records, but I remember one of the most intriguing ones to the, the students was the fact that uh, we've always heard that prostitution is the oldest uh, profession. Well, maybe surveyors weren't professional back then, but predating Constitution in the Bible, you will see records of marks of ownership on the ground. There are monuments still existent that have curses for he who moves this stone marking my boundaries. So the idea of marking boundaries uh, in the more civilized societies where there was recognition, and, and let's go to Egypt, uh, the Nile floodplain filed, uh, floods annually. So 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians had developed a method of surveying that allowed them to go back on this land that had been just awash from the Nile floods and reestablish the boundaries of each owner. So that the improvements done by that owner came back to him the next year after the flood receded. 
So boundaries have been established for a long time, and historically they predate prostitution. Now, I'm not going to argue with the prostitutes over it. I'll let them uh, hold that banner. But surveying and marking boundaries goes back historically well over 3,000 years. So this concept, whether it what evolved out of England or what evolved out of the Nile Valley or anywhere else, over time is perfected to be the best assurance that your land cannot be taken from you without cause. The protection of the property right. So it's not just a today thing. And a YouTube video is not going to change that. If the guy doesn't do his homework and you believe him, then you haven't done your homework. And if you tell somebody what you learned on YouTube... They haven't done their homework. So how many levels of absence of homework and and perhaps miscommunication have played into this concept that, oh, I can go park myself anywhere and own that land? Yeah, I wouldn't know, but it's definitely a discrepancy at the very least that I've noticed, which which does arrive at at a contradictory impasse at some point. But uh, thank you for uh, kind of explaining. Uh, you know, let's go back to Anglo-Saxon times. I built a house and I, I fenced my yard, and they found traces of the fencing, you know, pole fences. Um, uh, Jamestown, all these other places, they find that parcels are fenced out. Now, why were they fenced out? Because somebody said, this is mine. So history, all through history, we can go back thousands of years and find that these marks exist. Anglo-Saxon England, they dig, do excavations, and they find villages. They find the framework for the house, and every house has got a little fenced yard where they grew their crops. We've got streets, and we've got buildings that were probably commercial along those streets. So we have the concept of a public road, because you can't get to my building unless anybody can travel on that road. We've got private ownership in both commercial and the housing with the yards to grow crops. Common sense dictates this. Anything, if you've done, if you watch television, uh, Science Channel, Discovery Channel, History Channel, you've seen proof of the, the longevity of this whole concept of ownership. And to say, well, you know, if the government owns it, I can take it, that's absurd. It might have been true back in those expansive times. But in this country, it stopped with the sectionalized land surveys. I can't say when it stopped in England. Uh, but back in England, if we look at it, lords owned large a- areas. I'm sure they disputed their boundaries from fine- time to time and finally resolved them. And then the lords would allow tenements to exist on it in exchange for uh, quit rents or some uh, fee or uh, produce or something for it. But this concept of ownership, let's go to Jamestown and uh, Plymouth Colony, two of them that we have records of. These are rather interesting. They were both socialists when they got here. The Mayflower Compact, I've got uh, it posted on the Committee of Safety uh, article on my blog, but it says that all the food is going to go in this collective, and then there will be uh, the the ability to produce, you go into the collective, the ability or the need, the demand, it goes out. Well, Jamestown and, and Plymouth Colony were both failing. Because in Jamestown, I think it was, every year they drew uh, drew lots to see what parcel of land you would do, uh, grow your crops on. So why should I bring in manure and seaweed and all this stuff and try and improve my soil, till it, plow, uh, plow it, till it, and, and get uh, humus and you know bring in other materials to make it a more productive land when next year if I draw a different lot, I don't get that land. When they finally settled down to two things, selective ownership. Now, uh, Plymouth Colony, I might have them backwards, but Plymouth Colony, they marked their boundaries with the fences. I think it was Jamestown where they drew lots each year because it was a collective, a socialist collective. But when they finally said, okay, if you, you, if you improve this land, you get to use it next year, when that one, that one colony went to allowing that private ownership, or at least private possession of the land, uh, there was more improvement, and the yield of crops was even greater. 
But then when they went to the non-collective and allowed them to pr- pr- provide a percentage of their crop to the collective and keep what was left, in one account that I read, that corn actually became a sense of money, that people would gamble with corn. They would buy things, uh, you know, hey, you make a nice scarf, I'll give you two cobs of corn for that scarf. It became money because I got to keep some. It didn't have to go in the collective. And the survival of both Jamestown and Plymouth Colony were dependent on that conversion to absolute socialism to uh, the right of ownership. And that, so that right of ownership is exactly what we're talking about. So history's fraught with examples of the benefit and the necessity of private ownership uh, of land. All okay. right, well, yeah, thanks for explaining that. I, I appreciate it. All right, well, it's kind of getting late here, so uh, I'm going to have to get to bed. But uh, thank you for uh, clearing that up. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion in my mind, and as well as the fact I was kind of irked by what some of those folks were saying. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. Well, do you see that the common sense does apply? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm starting to. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a <laughs> it's definitely a paradigm shift. I'll, I'll put it that way. I'll tell you what, if you uh, play around with it a little while and still have some questions, let's revisit it. Okay. All right. Well, hey, thanks again, Gary. Appreciate it. Good night, Dom. Good night.